Good morning, Dr. Tim Joshin. Thank you all for coming to this talk on beautiful eyes. Okay, um, let's see here. So at Contour Dermatology, we're trying to provide a natural look for our patients. So they look natural and healthy and youthful and fresh. Now, a lot of cosmetic surgery uh, places, well, not a lot, but you, you see this out there and we see it in our practice. And um, I never really understood this. Um, I was always like, how could somebody let this happen to them? And I recently came to the conclusion that a lot of people like to get attention. They like to draw attention to themselves. And so they get affirmation that they're alive by people paying attention to them. And you see this when people go out in public and they, they dress flamboyantly or you know the women that get the super triple D's or the people that have the tattoos and things like that. So there is a reward to this. And I didn't understand it before, but I think that that's kind of the psychology behind that. But when you come here, this isn't what we're about in contour dermatology. What we're trying to do is, is, is kind of do the opposite. When you come here, what we want to do is we want to create a soft aesthetic where you just look better. And I love it when my patients say to me, you know, I had a facelift here and nobody really said you had a facelift. They just say that you look fresh. So we're kind of going for something a little bit different than this. Now, have you seen these people in our practice? Yes, <laughs> right? I saw one recently, we were out at Lavender Bistro in, in La Quinta, and there were women around in the surrounding area, and you can just focus in on them and go, wow, you know? So I, I find that really super fascinating. We're, we're not gonna take a quiz here, but um, we are gonna talk about what went wrong, because I think it's really important to understand what went wrong in order to understand how to do the right thing. So we need to understand what's good and we need to understand what's bad and we really need to analyze it, analyze it and say, okay, this is bad, we don't want to do this to people and this is why it's bad so we'll, we won't um, perpetuate bad cosmetic surgery. Ken, this guy is Kenny Rogers, for any of you who didn't know, and he, you know, he's sort of fading away now with the Mickey Rourke's and people like that that are becoming the new train wrecks in terms of cosmetic surgery. But if you look at Kenny Rogers, um, you know, what went wrong? Does anybody want to volunteer some input? Okay, Lee Belmonte. Uh, well, his eyes look feminine. What, what about them looks feminine? Well, they took out too much of the extra skin instead of trying to make it a natural. Right. Okay, right. So what we have here is we have a gentleman who had um, basically very little eyelid showing here. And then after his surgery, his eyelids are very prominent. And to me, they look a little bit smaller, perhaps, and so maybe they did a canthopexy here where they cut the skin here and pulled the eye up a little bit and made it a little bit smaller. And perhaps he had his eyelids raised here a little bit. It's had it tilted back here, which makes his eyelids look high here, but I'm suspecting that they raised his eyebrows here. And so it changed his look from having, you know, sparkly eyes to kind of um, unusual doll eyes, I think. And then here we have, um, uh, little Kim, right? Yes. Right, and um, you know, again, pretty obvious. You know, you can look at her and say something went wrong here, right? And uh, I think what she was doing is she was doing the Michael Jackson change her ethnicity through um, uh, nose surgery, and I also think that she um, had some fillers or cheek implants here, and of course she gained some weight, which is evident on the jawline, and just the weight gain can change people's face. Okay, here again, we just see a little bit of a nose alteration here, but nothing really too scary. Okay, so um, we're talking about the eyes, and the eyes are really very important. If people are going to put some money into cosmetic surgery, I think the eyes is one of the most important places to focus. And the reason for that is why, why do you guys have an idea why I think it's so important? It's the first place people look, and they've done studies to see where people look when they're looking at a face. And people focus their attention on the eyes, except in Elaine Wu's case. <laughs> Okay, and so, you know, when, when we're talking, we're, we're focusing here. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're here to talk about blepharoplasties, but really it's the whole cosmetic unit. And a cosmetic unit is an area that encompasses this whole um, region. So it's bounded by the eyebrow. We've got the upper eyelid, the, the thicker skin, the thinner skin. We have the eyelashes. And then they extend out here to the bony orbit. And here we'll see crow's feet. And then we have the lower eyelid skin, which is um, on the tarsal plate, which is the thick stuff here, and then all the way down here to the bone. And this is the tear trough. And what's nice in young people is it all kind of blends together, but as we get older, we'll see what happens to the eyelid. 
And um, one of the things to keep in mind is that there's a difference between ma female attractive eyes and male attractive eyes. And what you see with females is that they will show some eyelid here and then their eyebrows will be a little bit higher. Um, whereas men, the eyebrows tend to be um, lower and oftentimes you'll see in attractive men that their eyelashes almost touch their eyebrows. Um, second thing is most attractive men do not have a lot of eyelid showing either. Um, the surfaces are a little bit smoother in women and a little bit rougher in men. We'll see that here in a second. So shape and color are really important. You know, for dramatic eyes, you'll see people with brown eyes wear the blue contacts, right, to try to, to make them a little bit more dramatic. But, you know, just color can make eyes very dramatic. But shape, I think, is really important as well. Um, with eyelids, an almond-shaped upturned eye is considered more attractive in most cases. Um, and also, you'll notice in a youthful eye that it's really tight here along the lower part of the eyelid. Um, so those are two characteristics. And then, um, again, contour is really important in terms of eyelids. Um, you'll see here that, that there's a smooth transition between her forehead and her eye. Transit, smooth transition between the cheek and the eye where they're kind of blended. And then on, on the temple side here, you can see this is all smooth. There's not a distinct separation here. Now, over here, you can see um, that there's a little bit, in men, there's a little bit more contour changes that are still attractive here. But I think one thing that's really important is we see a lot of overfilling today. And it's important to keep in mind where you don't want to fill. And what we are seeing today is we're seeing a lot of this nasal, um, what, what's this called, tear trough filling right here. And so you see this tenting that happens because they're filling all the way from the nose down. And so it's really, in a beautiful person, they typically will have a little bit of hollowness here, a little bit of hollowness here. And you also will see hollowness in the temple area here. It's more prominent in the male patient here where you can see it right here. So we're doing a lot of filling in this area these days and it's important to keep in mind it's okay to fill the lower part here but we sort of want to keep an indentation along the temporal um uh there, there's a bone here the frontal bone and and the, the temple because if you if you fill that too much it just becomes rounded and it makes the eyes look closer together so and i think this line and i'm impressing upon this point especially for the providers to remember to not fill, make this too rounded keep a little line right here full below just above the, the um, uh, cheekbone um, to keep it looking fresh now makeup women are lucky because you know makeup can make such a huge difference in terms of the way a person looks you know we have sort of any girl on the street to glamour superstar here just by the, doing the right shadowing and stuff like that so now when we talk about the aging eye a lot of what happens in cosmetic surgery we used to believe it was sag and bag well, what we've started to realize is they're sagging back, but a huge contribution to the aging process is the deflation. And you can see that this um, upper eyelid becomes saggy baggy, and you'll see the skin, because of the deflation, will actually start to hang on the eyelashes. You can see on the temporal area, you'll start to see hollowness here. Veins will start to pop out. You get um, a, the, the eyelid, underneath the eyelid, um, the eye is actually held up. It's suspended up the eyeball and beneath it is fat and so what happens is that sling gets a little bit loose as we get older so that fat below the the eyeball will get pushed upon and it'll push it forward so as that sling loosens the fat gets pushed and goes forward a little bit so we'll see some fat protrusion right here and then we'll talk about this festoon here as well and um, here we can see a uh, real life what's going on. You see the deflation, which leads to that excess skin here. And we can also see on this side, how we talked about how the eye should be almond and up shape. Well, this becomes loose. And so you start to see the lower part of the eyelid. And a lot of older people, you'll see that when you pull this out, it doesn't retract because that's a loss of elasticity there. And with him, he's got the fat pads and he's starting to get these festoons. This is not from that protrusion of the fat out. This is just from the, the tissue becoming lax and there's a difference between and if you pinch, pinch your own face you'll see that there's loose skin here and then if you pinch your cheek it's tighter and so the festoon starts when the skin gets looser and looser here and um, this this thicker skin sort of is a boundary and so it just sort of hangs on that that um, thicker skin we'll see more pictures of that in a second okay so the eyebrow you know it's typically in women it's going to be above the bony orbital rim here um, in men, it's going to be at the bony orbit, maybe a little bit lower. 
And you can see eyebrow, this is great for estheticians. I mean, you guys are aware how the, the style changes over time. Um, you know, they used to paint the eyebrows up high. Have you guys seen our patients who do that? They, they actually shave their eyebrows and they tattoo them a lot higher. It's done in the Hispanic culture a little bit too, I think, isn't it? Um, so, and you can see um, here it was more rounded. And for a while I was in Vogue to have just like one line of hair. Now, Megan Fox, I think, is really beautiful. I think she's kind of the epitome of beauty today. But you can see her eyebrows are a little bit fuller here than um, they were in the past. And they tend to be um, lower, a little bit more natural looking. Okay, so brow treatments, we've got lots of different things we can do. Um, since we're talking about surgical stuff, we'll talk a little bit about brow lifting. Um, in our office, we also will do a little bit of hair transplantation. But I, I really don't think that this provides a very natural result. And so unless it's for a um, person who has had, has a uh, disease, I, I, I'm really not, like they've had alopecia universalis where they've lost all the hair on the body and they're really self-conscious about it. I don't like this option. The hairs never seem to grow in the right direction when they're transplanted. Um, I do love Latisse. I've started using Latisse because I have a genetic um, predisposition to lose the side of my eyebrows. And, my eyebrows have really started to regrow after just a couple months, so I think that that's a great option for eyebrows. Um, one of the things with the loose skin that starts to hang on your eyelids, there are two treatment options. One, one is to lift up the eyebrows and lift up the skin off the eyelashes, or the, the second is to cut the skin out. We're talking about brow lift here. Now, for most people, this isn't gonna be a great option. I'd say for 99% of people, this isn't a great option, because you can see here Jessica Lang when she was young, her brows were in a, in a normal position right above her, um, eye, above her bone here, above her bony over it. Here she has it raised. And does anybody here think that that's attractive? No. It looks artificial to me. It looks too high. It's that surprise look that you see. And so to me, I don't like this look. And the way you can tell if a person is going to need a eyebrow lift versus just the skin excision is you're going to just lift the eyebrows up on them and that will give you an indication whether that's going to be a good treatment option or not. Um, and like I said, in most people it's not going to be a good treatment option. The place where I see this being um, a reasonable option for surgery is if their eyebrows are hanging down below their bony orbital rim. In that case, we do probably need to lift it up a little bit. And you'll see when the heaviness starts to slip down and fall on their eyelashes. Okay, so, um, and for men, I think, you know, we have Bruce Jenner here, his son, I guess this is Brody Jenner, is that true? Okay, so we've got Bruce Jenner, handsome athlete, had some bad surgery, what happened is too much eyelid, probably raised his brows just a little bit, um, and um, so what's the difference here? Well, first of all, Brody's got really um, handsome eyebrows here, they're a lot thicker, and just having, you know, the brows repositioned would be great. But you can also see that here that he doesn't have a lot of eyelids showing. And also there's a lot of um, bone showing here and he doesn't have that bone showing. So there's a lot more fullness there. So we could do a better job on him just by um, getting his eyebrows some, some Latisse and then by putting some filler in here and probably not have taking out so much fat there. Okay, tattooing. I'm just an anti-tattoo person for cosmetic surgery. Because for one thing, I really feel that the tattoos never look natural over time. They, um, become a steel gray color that doesn't look beautiful. So I'm just not a big fan. And we also have patients that come in and they have the tattoos been misplaced, they'll have it too close or too far away. So I don't love that at all. Um, crow's feet are these wrinkles on the side of the eyes and they come in either static form or um, dynamic form. Now the difference is dynamic wrinkles are when you smile and they crinkle and when you stop smiling they go away. So that means you haven't lost all your collagen and elastic fibers, and so they'll just disappear. Now, if they're static, that means that even when you're not smiling, you have the wrinkles, okay? So for the static ones, we're gonna to have to do something else because just relaxing the muscle isn't gonna make these go away. So the ones that where you're crunching, see she, he, she's got that half smile going? If we just relax these, they'll disappear. So for Botox, um, it gives excellent results. There are a couple risks of an unnatural smile or vertical descent of wrinkles. And you can see here, this is Nicole Kidman. She still has some, you know, she, they used to say she was overtoxed, and now she talks in, in the press about not getting as much Botox, and she likes to be able to smile again. Well, I don't really think that this is a horrible result. She's got a little bit of crow's feet here, a little bit of bunny line here. But you can see when she smiles, her cheeks go up, creating a little bit of this wrinkling right here. We want to continue to have the cheeks go up when we do Botox. If we over Botox, we use 15 units of Botox here. Some people will use more, 20, 25 units. 
And so if you start to go down here a little bit lower, what will happen is it will interfere with some of the facial muscles and you won't be able to raise your cheeks anymore. And we don't want that look to occur. Okay, and here the lady's got some, uh, some crinkling here. What happens is if women have a lot of wrinkling here, if they put too much Botox in, these wrinkles will go from horizontal into a vertical descent. And it makes the wrinkles look even worse because it, it loses the muscle tone underneath the skin. And so with that loss of muscle tone, the wrinkles can go down even more. Okay, so um, for a lot of our patients who have the loss of fat, collagen, and elastic fibers, we will do a little bit of hyaluronic acid as well. I'm not a big fan of fat because fat can lead to lumpy bumps underneath the eyes and it's, it's not a good look. And we actually have a couple patients here who've had some fat transfer and we're trying to melt it with our re with our uh, sublime and we're trying to do all kinds of different tricks to get it to go away. Sculpture is not a good option either and who knows why. The sculptomas, the little lumps, exactly. So here you can see um, we want to revolumize to get this kind of look as opposed to this deflated look here. What else would we want to do in this case? Anybody tell me? CO2. CO2, why? Um, it'll help tighten Shrink and tighten the skin because we want to get rid of some of that excess skin. And then what else would we? Uh, so we want to do the volume here and uh, increase and in, replace some of the volume here and here. And for here we could put fillers in the brow area. And it looks like she needs an appointment with Anne Marie and some lucky. <laughs> okay. So veins can be distracting because you can see here um, the veins around the eyes start to protrude, and that's because we lose um, the buffer between. Um, uh, the buffer between the veins and we also have the veins dilate a little bit and we're lucky because we have um, treatment options here does anybody want to tell me what the treatment option is for the veins here the XLV, the, the, XLV, the 1064 so this is a really nice treatment um, and the, the difficulty with that is it may require um, multiple treatments and sometimes the veins are super deep so we can't access them okay so blepharoplasties. The blepharoplasty is a treatment option where we can remove some of the skin here, and if we have a fat pad here, we can remove that as well. So we lift that droopy excess skin that's resting on the eyelashes and cut it out. It's a really nice procedure um, because it has minimal risk. It's about a half an hour procedure. We have a really high patient satisfaction. Um, with excess skin on the lower eyelids, I used to do a lot of excision along the um, lash line here to take out skin, but one of the risks with this, and you see this in our patients, is if you take out too much skin, um, it can actually pull the eyelid down. So um, you can see this, what we call ectropion, where the eye pulls away from the eyeball. So we've really moved away from um, taking away excess skin, except in very young patients where they have good elasticity and their, their tendons are really tight on the side of their eyelids. Laser is what our preferred method of shrinking up that excess skin underneath the eyes. Um, it tightens the skin and it doesn't have the risk of ectropion. The one thing that you will see with this laser is that there's some redness that can occur that can last one to three months. And you can see here this guy had a lot of fat and a lot of excess skin. And just with the treatment, he still has a little bit of excess skin. He had a lot, so we've reduced it like 90%. He'd probably benefit from another treatment. Okay, so the eye fat, with the um, lower lid blepharoplasty, what we're targeting is the eyelid fat here. And the way you can tell uh, this fat from a festoon is if you have the patients look up, the festoon will actually, or the, the um, fat will actually pop out a little bit more, um, but the festoon will not, not move. Okay. So with the lower lid blepharoplasty, it's a very simple procedure. This is even easier than the upper eyelid skin. We just pull down the eyelid. We make a small incision. The fat will actually pop out. We shave it off and we let it go of the eyelid. So we can do this in five to 10 minutes per eyelid. And the great thing about this procedure is that there's no visible scar. And so you can see here, she had prominent fat pads and they're gone after the <coughs> procedure. And here, what we did was we had um, fat pads here but we also had dark circles. So what we had to do is we did a little fat in here, we did a little laser, and um, it totally changes the eye. And of course, with young people, they always look better. Does anybody know why? They still have the elasticity in their skin, everything is in the right place. So young people always look better. And so um, the last thing I wanna really discuss in this is uh, dark circles, because people are gonna ask you this all the time. I mean, you probably get asked up at the front, right? 
People ask, well, what can I do for my dark circles? Well, there are, there are different causes for darkness underneath the eyes. The one thing is um, a hereditary situation where it's just pigmentation. And we're going to see it most commonly in darker skin types, Mediterranean skin types, African American, and um, Hispanic. And this is just pigmentation. So now we have some great treatment options for this. Um, and you guys know this as well, if not better than I do. First thing is Retin-A will normalize production of pigment. And then it'll also exfoliate the superficial layer of the skin so our other products can penetrate a little bit better. Now they say don't use this around the eyes and that's just because the skin is a little sensitive and so it may get a little bit red and irritated. But if you continue to use this and you mix it with another product, we're going to minimize that. So we have some great bleaching agents. I'm still the, a huge fan of hydroquinone. Then we have things like kojic acid and um, licorice ex extract. And what's the new one called that we have? The Lytera. Lytera. What's the bleaching agent in that or the lightening agent? Okay. There. It's a lot of natural products, but they have their own patented um, product too, not supposed to have the light. Okay, so we have a treatment option for dark circles. And then another thing that can happen is the skin is very thin here, and so we have blood vessels underneath the skin. So sometimes those will show through a little bit, and if that happens, um, our best treatment option is going to be what? Anyone want to help me? What's that? XLV. So it's a laser to help target blood vessels. Okay. <laughs> And then you have another thing that can create dark circles is the bags. Because what they can do is they can create shadowing underneath the eyes. So what's the treatment option for bags? Lower blepharoplasty. Exactly. Exactly. So you can see here she's got the prominent bags after the surgery. She looks better. Of course, she, she could have benefited from additional treatments with a laser to tighten it up a little bit more and some fillers to fill in this hollowness right here. But it, did, it was a pretty dynamic improvement. Next thing we have is just hollowness because the light can, can get caught in a, in a hollow circle. And so um, our treatment for hollowness underneath the eyes is to do fillers. And so we have a gentleman here. He had the bags underneath his eyes. We um, did a little fat transfer. We did um, some laser to tighten it up. And he had a pretty dramatic result. And again, he's young, so his elasticity is, is really right there. Um, importance of lashes. What do we have to help people with their lashes here? The teeth. Okay. I'm, I'm a huge fan since my eyebrows started to regrow. <laughs> Somebody told me I look younger. So that's the right word to tell me. Let me tell you. So um, it's used for hypotrichosis, and that means a loss of eyelashes or eyebrows. It makes them longer, thicker, and fuller. Um, you get results within eight weeks. Optimal results are in four months. You do daily application, and the side effects are really minimal for cosmetic purposes. And so you can just see how it looks. Um, really, there's a new one called Bolotero. It's really great because it's um, a little bit less highly cross-linked, which means it's a little bit smoother than any of the hyaluronic acids, except you cannot use um, Juvederm or Ju Juvederm Ultra or Ultra Plus. Excuse me. And the reason for that is they're hydrophilic. They draw water in, and so they look swollen. And so you actually can create a look like you need a blepharoplasty or sinus surgery. And so last thing I want to mention is festoons. And it's really important to point out the difference between a fat bulge and a festoon for your patients because if they have a fat pad here, we can eliminate that. But if we tell them we're going to eliminate the, the fat pads underneath their eyes, they may be confused and think this is their fat pad. That is called a festoon. And you can see that's where you have the thicker skin here and then you have this looser skin underneath the eyelid. And so what happens is um, this just gets, uh, uh, the skin gets looser, you lose elastic fibers. You lose collagen underneath there, so this skin starts to sag and bag and it gets caught on that thicker skin. And then, so we want to use multiple treatments. Um, you know, usually for the eyes, you want to do multiple treatments in order to get the optimal result. And so you can see here, Demi, Demi she calls herself Demi, not Demi. So um, she needs a bunch of things. She, what, what do you think she needs? Yes, don't call her, when you see her, you know, when you go to her house, don't call her Demi, it's Demi. <laughs> Okay, what can we do for her? Filler, CO2, Botox. Um, you know, she needs quite a few things. And she's getting to the point where she may need a little upper eyelid surgery, right? And so, um, I just forgot to show you the most beautiful eyes ever. That's the best beautiful.